So, so it is my great pleasure to... <laughs> ah, hello, thanks for, for staying around. Uh, welcome to, the, the, to, 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 to my le lecture. I will do slides. However, uh, uh, if you think that we should switch to the blackboard, please just let me know and we'll do it, okay? So, yeah. Yes, exactly. So we'll, we'll make a short break after like for 40 minutes, and then if you approach, if at least two people approach me saying do it on the blackboard, we'll, uh, I'll do that. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, I will be talking about essentially uh, semi-groups or monoids and their generalizations. So, uh, and the connection to logic. In, in, in the lectures of Moshe and, and Stefan, you have seen monadic second-order logic. And this will be of also a central part of, of my lecture. Uh, in, mine will be closer to Moshe's, so it will be about questions like, given an MSO formula, decide if it's true in some model. But I will not use automata. I will use uh, a, mo a more algebraic uh, vocabulary. And I'll try to explain why. Automata are great, but this is a, a different view. I think it's good to have both. Uh, so the lecture will have, uh, and uh, so recognizable in the title, it means recognized by some kind of, well, recognizable is a vague word. It could mean anything. Uh, uh, Slightly more specifically, it means recognized by a finite device, and even more specifically, so that would still cover recognized by an automaton, but I will use it in the sense recognized by a finite algebra, with a wide varieties of algebras being allowed, and later on in the lecture, I will try to make it even more precise, what, is the, what does that mean in general? Uh, so the lecture will have four parts, uh, which should correspond to the four units, but, you know, maybe they will spill out. Uh, in the first part, which is now, it's going to be about finite words. And in this case, the algebras are going to be uh, semi-groups or monoids. It's essentially the same thing. So uh, I will probably use one word or the other and forget about the difference. And uh, the important application is going to be MSO, as, as in Moshe's talk. That's going to be the first talk part. In the second part, it's going to be about various kinds of infinite words. So not only those that Moshe described, which is like the, the positions of the word are indexed by the natural numbers, but maybe some slightly more general infinite words. So for example, words where the positions are indexed by integers or maybe even rational numbers, that type of infinite words. And algebras for them. And there will be uh, more and more general notions of infinite words with more and more uh, general notions of algebras, and my intention is that by the end of lecture two, you will have seen like four or five different algebras, and uh, with, this, with each time I will redefine what it means to be an algebra, what it means to be a homomorphism, what it means for a language to be defined by something, and the intention is that, that by that time you will ask, no, please give me a general notion uh, uh, which generalizes all of that, and if... Uh, and that's supposed to happen in the third part. So it's going to be, what does it mean to be an algebra in general? And uh, so in this third part, it's going to be in general. So there's going to be in general, in generalology. So there's going to be commuting diagrams and that type of thing. Uh, so one of the ideas is that it's nice to see once in a while a proof where you do a commuting diagram. I was always afraid of these proofs and maybe I even admit it, I disrespected such proofs, uh, but I've come around, and um, <laughs> that's how it always happens. <laughs> no shame in that. <laughs> and so I think, yeah, we'll have like one or two commuting diagrams so that, you know, you'll have seen a few commuting diagrams if you haven't seen them before. So that's the third part. And in the fourth part, going to be a more combinatorial again to maybe counterbalance the third part and this is going to be about algebras for graphs uh, uh, so 
the first two parts about various types of words, so linear structures, may be infinite, but linear. And then you can generalize that in m m many nonlinear ways, the trees being the most maybe natural and famous one, but graphs go even beyond that, and I'll try to illustrate some of the I issues that appear there. So that, that's the overview of the lecture, but uh, uh, right now we begin with finite words, relatively painless, and m almost uh, the entire lecture, uh, 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 the first lecture, will be about this triangle which is also underlying uh, some of the things that Moshe is talking about. And I am talking about finite words, okay? I will then generalize to infinite words, but I'll start with finite words. And the result is this, that for a language of finite words, there's three different ways to uh, uh, equivalent views. One of them is recognized by a finite automaton, so regular. The other one is definable in monadic second-order logic, and the equivalence of these two was already shown by Moshe. But I will revisit it and also reprove it for two reasons. Number one, it's recorded, so uh, I want it to be sort of uh, complete. So, hi, people in the... <laughs> in exactly. And number two... Far away in the future, hello there. <laughs> one or two people in the future. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the, the other reason is going to be that the proof will be different. Uh, and uh, so I want to show you a different uh, proof, and I think it's also instru instructive to, to know the different proof, which will also be helpful for the infinite generalization. And the third condition, which is something that uh, Moshe did not talk about, is the algebraic approach, which is to use uh, monoids, which I will define and, and, and illustrate, uh, and justify their existence uh, uh, as, a, as an alternative. And I'll try to explain why it is helpful to have this third uh, node in the triangle. Nicola, you should tell the future generation, we come in peace. <laughs> we come in peace. <laughs> Dear computers, <laughs> it, it wasn't me who <laughs> deleted the system, it was Moshe. <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I always try to be nice to the computer because you know later you never know. Eh? <laughs> so please, you know, it, it's all true. Uh, okay, so uh, we all know what a regular language is. So I won't go there. So it's recognized by a finite automaton, a device like this. So nothing, no need to explain that. And just wanted to underline this was already mentioned. In, in Moshe's talk, but uh, some of you know it as well, that there's a robustness in the model of automata. So it can be deterministic, non-deterministic, and it can be alternating. It can be two-way, it can be two-way alternating, it can have pebbles, it can be alternating two-way with pebbles, and it all gives the same results. Okay, so it's a very robust notion. And there's also regular expressions. These are the things that I'm not going to use in my talk. Okay, but these are things that, 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 that should uh, ground your intuition. Uh, the second notion is MSO, and again, you have seen this with Moshe, so, uh, but I will explain it just once again in case uh, you have forgotten. And, and the underlying idea is to use logic to specify properties of graphs and trees and words and so on. In the end, I will be interested mainly in words, at least in this first lecture. Uh, so. Examples are to use first-order logic, as in Stefan's lecture. So you model a graph as a, a, a structure. So there's, as, as, as we have seen, there's different ways to do it, depending on whether the universe is, is, is vertices or vertices and edges and so on. And then you can express properties such as this using logic, first-order logic. You can also uh, do trees. This is, a, I think, a very important example, at least for me. It's one that I find very interesting. Uh, or where you model a tree, so essentially it's about graphs. But for example, when you do trees, a typical thing to do is to have a descendant relation, which goes beyond what Stefan described, because he would model if you if, if you would do, do uh, uh, Stefan's approach, a, a tree would be uh, would have a, 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 an edge a successor relation, and this is transitive closure, which kind of breaks many of the results. Okay? And then you can use MSO. So, 
MSO, as you can see, this is an example of an MSO formula, and I just recall to you what it means, is that you're allowed to quantify over sets of elements in the universe. So, for example, if you view a graph as a relational structure where there's the vertices as the elements of the universe, and then there's the uh, relations such as there is an edge from X to Y, and that's maybe that's the entire signature you have, then in an MSO formula, you're allowed to quantify over sets, subsets of the universe, which correspond in this particular case to sets of edges, and then you can talk up, use first order logic as well, and this is an example of an MSO formula, it's the literal uh, uh, formalization of being pre colorable. Uh, and what I try to do is uh, uh, next to each formula, I try to write in word what it means because all my formulas are wrong. Okay, so uh, this is the binding text. <laughs> this is the attempt at formalization, and uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's kind of uh, interesting because I think th this is not just with me. I mean, a lot of people, when they have a sentence and they try to write it as a formula, there's always some symbol which goes the other way, some and, which kind of contradicts this, this principle that logic is the natural language. It's like almost natural, but there's something missing. <laughs> because if you, if you see a sentence like this, then you clearly see that it's wrong or right. I mean, I mean, but this, uh, you look at it and it bounces off your head and you don't know if it's wrong or <laughs> Well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. And for example, a celebrated theorem, which will not be part of my lecture, is Fagin's theorem, which says that a property of graphs and uh, you could, well, this would also work for words and so on, is in NP, if and only if it's definable in something called existential second-order logic. So you're allowed to quantify here existentially over sets, but even of sets of pairs or sets of triples and so on, that's okay in, in existential second-order logic. And inside you have a first-order core. But this is existential only. So that's a, 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 a very important theorem. And... Uh, that's the kind of logics you could use to specify properties of structures such as these. In my talk, I will be interested mainly in MSO. Okay? So uh, let me draw the picture of the logics that are involved. You have first order logic. You can extend it to existential second order logic as in Fagin's theorem. So you're allowed to quantify existentially over sets of pairs or triples or single elements. And then this by Fagin's theorem, it corresponds to NP. Then you have full second order logic where the existential quantification is not necessary, the quantification over sets of pairs or triples is not necessarily existential. This is equivalent to the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, one thing that you have in between is that something that if, if you not, haven't seen it, it's good to know, is uh, uh, because this corresponds to NP, so naturally, you know, what corresponds to P. And uh, it's something like first order logic with fixed points. And there's a beautiful theorem by Moshe and Neil Immerman, which says that this logic has exactly the same expressive power as polynomial time, as long as your structure is ordered. And there's a very interesting theory around that. But this is not part of this lecture. Okay? This lecture is about this logic, MSO. So it's stronger than first order logic because you're allowed to quantify over sets of positions. For example, you, over graphs, you can express three colorability. However, it's incomparable with all of these logics, exe except for this one, which is obviously contained in by definition. You can quantify over sets of, uh, uh, sets of vertices. So for example, uh, you subject to P equal to NP, you cannot do this in first order logic with fixed fix points, because this would imply that it's in polynomial time. And here you can express three colorability. And there's, there's other reasons why the picture is drawn as it is this way. Let's not go into that. That's not the main topic. So this is the logic. It's kind of orthogonal to these. And, but it's the one that's very important when you're interested in properties, not of graphs, but of things like words or trees. And the reasons for that will be explained. But you have already seen them, because it's exactly the same thing as regular languages. So that, that's, that's why it, it's, it means it's some important class. And this is the one that we will be studying here. Okay? So, we use MSO. Now, I, I don't think I'm going to give you the, uh, going to spend too much time on the semantics. So just remember, 
the idea is, as, as Moshe said, you model a word as a structure where the universe is the positions in the word. There's a binary predicate for the order, and there you have for each label which could appear potentially in the word, you have a unary predicate which says that is the label of that position. And then over structures of this form, you execute monadic second order logic, which is where you're allowed to quantify over sets of positions and over individual positions. This formula, similarly as the formula for free colorability, is of the special existential type, meaning that the set quantification is used only outside in an existential prefix. In principle, you could negate this formula and you know, alternate set quantif so for every set exists a set such that for every set that's allowed. However, it, it so happens that uh, there will always be an equ equivalent formula of this form as we will see later on over things like words or, or trees. So these are the, f the formulas that we study. You have already seen them in the lecture of Moshe, also in the lecture of, of Stefan. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on that. Maybe just one thing to get you uh, trained a little bit in this logic. If you look at my example, my example is supposed to say that the word has even length. How does it, when does a word has even length? And this, this was already mentioned again in the lecture of Moshe. A word has even length if you, there exists a set of positions such that it contains every other position. So for every position, if it's in the set, then the next one is not. And if it is not in the set, then the next one is. And then it contains the first, but not the last. And something like this. <laughs> I, ho I hope I have written it right. So this is, exists a set of positions which contains every second position, contains the first one, and contains the last one. So this means it's of odd length. <laughs> okay? And uh, one thing that you will see is that here I used the order as I promised I would. Well, okay, here it's strict and here it's non-strict, but that, that can be easily <coughs> or equal. And here I use the successor. Technically speaking, this is not part of the signature, and I will make a, a short comment about it, which is that it doesn't really matter because as long as you have monadic second order logic, you can express successor in terms of order, and you, you, it's only sufficient to have first order logic because, well, what does successor mean? It means that it's, you know, the a position that is later and there's nothing in between. So that's, that can be easily expressed in first order logic. So as long as you have first order logic or more, such as MSO, then, you know, if you start out with order, you can add successor. That doesn't cost you too much. However, the opposite is also true. So if you have, but this time you really need the power of MSO. I could have, as long as my intention is to use MSO, I could have assumed that my words are modeled as positions with a successor function or a successor binary relation, doesn't really matter. Why? So how can I define order in terms of successor? Well, how do you say that this position Y is later than this position X? Well, you say that whenever I take a set which contains X and is closed under successor, then it necessarily has to contain Y. And this is clearly an MSO formula at work here, because it says for every set of positions, if it contains X and is closed under successor, then it also contains Y. Okay, so using MSO, you can get uh, order from successor, and therefore some people view words as, as, uh, uh, as, as structures with a successor function and trees as structures with uh, two successor functions. You can also do the order. It doesn't matter as long as your logic is MSO. If your logic is not MSO, it's FO, uh, then th these things become different over words. Uh, FO with successor is a different logic than FO with order. It has less expressive power. Uh, typical thing that you cannot say with successor, but you can say with order, is that as long as your alphabet is, say, ABC, there exist two positions and such that one has A, the other has B, and they're in this order. Okay, so the A is before the B. Uh, if you only have successor, then using the Geifman theorem, you can figure out that, that, that you can swap these two positions and, and, and nothing would be noticed. But we're going to use MSO, so it doesn't really matter if I use successor or order. I, let's just assume I use order. Okay? Uh, and therefore, I say that the language is MSO definable, for example, of alphabet ABC, but this definition is no, in no way specific to a three element alphabet. If there's a MSO formula, 
which uses predicates for order for the labels A, B, or C, and such that it's, it's uh, a, a word belongs to the language if and only if uh, the, f the word viewed as the structure in this sense satisfies the form. So that, 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 that's a pretty simple thing. So that's what it means for a language to be, language of words to be MSO definable. I said we will sometimes talk about first order logic as a tool of specifying properties of words, and I, I don't think we will. But for example, Moshe does, because he talks about LTL and he mentioned this. I think uh, first order logic will be, appear maybe once or twice in these slides. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the second part. And as you saw in Moshe's talk, these two have the same expressive power. So one way to prove this is to say that, uh, well, let's start with the easy implication, which says that if you're regular, then you're MSO definable. This is very easy. It says, uh, because in MSO, you're, uh, you can directly formalize an, uh, uh, the, accept existence, the acceptance by an automaton. It's just strong enough to do the direct formalization of it, so let's say it more precisely, for every non-deterministic fine automaton, you can write a formula of MSO, which is true exactly in the words accepted by the automaton, and this formula, it just says, there exists an accepting run. And well, you have to use it using the syntax, but it's nothing, so that it's true exactly in words which have an accepting run, and the formula just says that. So if this is your input word over a, an alphabet, I think, of three colors, then the formula just says, there exists an accepting run. So what's an accepting run? It's a sequence of states which are in between positions, including before the first and after the last. So subject to uh, the transition relation of the automaton. And then to formalize this, the existence of such a run in MSO, you say there exist sets P, Q, and R, sets of positions. Implicitly, these sets say uh, over which positions you have state P and which ones you have Q and so on. And then... Uh, you just say, you just formalize that the automaton does it. So you say every position has one state. The run begins in an initial state and ends in a final state. Consecutive positions are connected by transition. You just formalize this using logic in the obvious way. Okay? So that's, uh, I think I wrote one of those, but I'm sure it's wrong. So let's keep the font small. So this gives you the implication that every NFA can be sim simulated in MSO. So for every NFA, there's an MSO formula which is true in the words accepted by that. Therefore, uh, regular languages are contained in MSO definable language. For the converse direction, which you have seen in Moshe's talk, well, we, one way you could do it, you could say, well, what are the connectives in MSO? You have Boolean combinations, and you have existential set quantification and existential element quantification. And then if you think about it, these connectives, they correspond to language operations. So Boolean combinations com correspond to Boolean operations and languages. Existential set quantification corresponds to guessing something in some way. And if you think about it, uh, uh, deterministic automata are closed under Boolean combinations, and non-deterministic automata are closed under the guessing. And since they're the same, then uh, the class of regular languages has all the appropriate, all the necessary closure properties to uh, simulate MSO. So that's one way to do it. But this is not going to be the way that we will do it in this lecture. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's, that's so far the basics. And now let's go to the, the, the main topic of my, of my lecture, which is the use of algebras. Okay? So I will be using algebras and not monoids. Uh, so what is a monoid? Uh, let me remind you the definition. A monoid is a structure which consists of a universe, a, a set, the underlying set of the monoid. It has a binary multiplication operation, so you can take two elements of the monoid and can multiply them. And you also have a neutral element, uh, which yeah, is ignored by multiplication. And the formal definition is that multiplication should be associative and ignore one. Let me remind you what <laughs> all of this means, but this is very easy. In principle, the operation, the binary multiplication operation, if you construct a term, then, you know, it could be, you could typically use it using parentheses, but I'll draw it as a tree. There's different parse trees that you could apply multiplication. And uh, associativity says that the value is insensitive to the parse tree. So no matter how you draw the parse tree, as long as the sequence of leaves from left to right is the same, the value is the same. 
the way you typically draw, uh, define it is you just give one associativity equation, and if you think about it in terms of trees, it says that you can do the rotation on these trees. And it is a straightforward exercise that if you, have, if you're, if, if you can do rotation, then you can take any tree and transform it into any other tree of the same sequence of leaves from left to right. So that's, that's, uh, that's what associativity is about. And furthermore, there's this identity element which is ignored. Okay? So the, and since it does not depend on the parse tree, we can just write this without drawing the parentheses, and that's what the monoid is. Okay, so the monoids, I think there's, I give you some examples. Uh, one example is zero, one with multiplication. So the, the, the principle behind a monoid is that you, if you give a sequence of elements and you want to multiply it, then you don't need to know the order in which it was done. And this is clear if you have a sequence of elements to multiply. Well, I mean, this is now like, it's, it's, this is something that eight, eight-year-old children or, I don't know, nine-year-old children are, are taught, although it doesn't make any sense I mean, at that stage to use the word associativity, but that's how it's done, at least in Poland, at least when I was a student. <laughs> it's a nightmare. I mean, they tell you multiplication is associative. But what sense does this make? What sense does it make now? <laughs> and they tell you in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> it's shorter. It's like one of those words where in Polish it's shorter than in English. But well, you remove all the vowels, right? <laughs> in Polish, you probably do. <laughs> multiplication is. Uh, another famous one is the two element group, uh, so zero, one with addition. Another important, a very important example is the set of all possibly empty words over a given alphabet. And here's a very important example. If you take any set Q, for example, the state space of an automaton, uh, and then you take all functions from Q to Q, then this forms a monoid uh, where the uh, multiplication operation is composition of functions. The neutral element is the identity function, and uh, it's, it's easy to see that composition of functions is associative, and uh, that's an important monoid. One reason is, for example, that uh, for example, every finite monoid is, is, is a special case of this. I have a profound question. Where does the phrase Polish notation come from? I think it comes from the fact that it was invented by Łukasiewicz, a Polish logician. Yeah. And you could say Łukasiewicz notation, but it was too long to say it, so they say Polish notation. <laughs> <laughs> We're very patriotic in this country. You know, we just have pole number one, pole number two, and <laughs> so yeah. It was uh... another important example uh, will be that. Uh, and the reason for this importance of this example is that this will, the fact that this is a monoid essentially explains why regular languages are the same thing as languages recognized by finite semigroups. Because if you take an automaton, then the natural monoid which will correspond to it is going to be this one. And we'll see that in the proof. Or we, we won't actually. Uh, here's an another one. Your elements are not functions but re binary relations, which can also be viewed as multi-valued functions. And if you compose two binary relations, it's another binary relation, the operation is associative, and the neutral element is the identity relation. And this is another type of monoid, and this is the monoid you get when you transform a non-deterministic automaton into a monoid. Yeah, so this is another proof why regular languages are recognized by monoids. A non-example, <laughs> it's not so easy to come up with a, uh, an, a, an a, a operation on a two-element set which is non-associative, uh, like, I don't know, more than half of them are associative. Uh, uh, but implication is one of them. So there's two different parse trees of implication and they, they don't give the same result. That's one reason why it's not a monoid. And then the other reason is that it's, uh, even if it would be associative, it's not, which it's not, uh, uh, you wouldn't know how to have the neutral element for, for implication. So that's, that's a non-example of, of being a monoid. Okay. And, uh, what does it mean for a language to be recognized by a monoid? It means that there's a monoid homomorphism which recognizes. And what's a monoid homomorphism? Again, this is a very simple notion that I'm sure you've seen. I try to go over these things slowly, in particular because I will repeat the structure of defining what a monoid is, what a monoid homomorphism is, what does it mean to be recognized by a monoid homomorphism for more and more fancy structures. That's why I'm going at this level of detail. Okay? So we will see this uh, slide being repeated several times with different notions of monoids. Okay? So that, that's why I'm doing it 
as slowly as this. So a monoid homomorphism, what is that? It's a function from one monoid to another, which is consistent with the structure of monoids. And the structure of monoids is multiplication and the unit. So uh, that means that the homomorphism maps the unit from the input monoid to the unit of the output monoid. And if you multiply in the input monoid and apply the homomorphism, then you could do it afterwards as well. That, that's, it just preserves the structure. And uh, so a language is defined to be recognized by a finite monoid if there exists a homomorphism from all possible words, not only those in the language, to some finite monoid. Uh, it's, a, it's a homomorphism such that if you want to know if a word belongs to the language, then you just apply the homomorphism, you see the corresponding element, and that's enough to tell. So formally speaking, that means that there's a set of accepting elements, those which are correspond to the language, and the remaining ones correspond to the non-language, such that a word belongs to the language if and only if its image is an accepting element. So there's nothing going on. It's a very, very straightforward definition. I wanted to do it very slowly so that the generalizations will, will, will come more naturally. Okay? Uh, so that's uh, recognition by finite monoids. Of course, you could say recognized by not necessarily finite monoid. You could do that as well. This would be a trivial notion because every language is recognized by a not necessarily finite monoid because you could take the identity function from sigma star to sigma star and then the accepting subset is going to be your language. So there's nothing to be gained by that. And uh, let's maybe, uh, before we uh, continue, there is a little disadvantage to this approach which is it's very easy to define an automaton. You draw states, you draw arrows, and you're done. For a monoid, it's a bit inconvenient because, well, you define your states or elements of the monoid, and then you write how they're multiplied, but then, in principle, you should check that it's associative. And this can be tedious. So it's typically something that you say it can easily be checked, and typically it's wrong, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so this is a, a, a disadvantage of this approach. A second disadvantage is uh, that you need to have, uh, when you have a function, you need to show that it's a homomorphism. So again, you need to check that it preserves this. And this is, this is annoying. I mean, it's, it's not a difficult, but it's, it typically wastes your time a bit. So there's an alternative view at, 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 at uh, recognizability by finite monoids, which I would like to present now, uh, which is very helpful. And we will see how it's helpful, for example, in the context of MSO. So how does it work? Uh, maybe before uh, explaining how it works, I will give you a motivation. So we will show in a moment that every MSO definable language is recognized by, satisfies this condition, is recognized by some finite monoid. And this finite monoid is going to be, uh, the elements of the monoid are going to be these K types that Stefan described in his, in his lecture, so to each word I'm going to associate the set of MSO formulas of appropriate quantifier rank. This is going to be true, but if you would like to show that it's an actual homomorphism, what you would need to formally do is you would need to say that the set of K types has a multiplication operation and you need to define this multiplication operation, and that's a nightmare. You have to, it's, it, 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 it's just boring, it's, it's, and it's not easy, and then you need to show that the function which associates to a word its k-type is a homomorphism and that's again a little bit boring. So there's a way to avoid that, which is, uh, which is the following thing, I don't know, compositionality principle or something, which I will explain now, which is to use function, comp something called, I don't know, compositional functions, uh, alter alternative name is a congruence. This is going to be the same kind of notion. And the idea, is, well, compositionality is a general thing. I mean, you can have compositionality anywhere. So compositionality is anything that's subject to this slogan. Some function is compositional if, you know, the, the value of the bigger thing depends on the values on the smaller part. Let's specify this notion to functions from words to some set. And I will be talking about that. So suppose I have a function h from some, from words to some set. This, this, it's called m and h to suggest it's a homomorphism to a monoid. But so far, it's not. So it's just some set. There's no multiplication operation here. And it's some function. What does it mean for this function to be compositional? Well, it means to be subject to this slogan, such that combining parts is the same thing as 
concatenating words. So let's, let's write it out what it means to be compositional. A function is compositional if you take two words, the left part and the right part, so it's an element of pairs of words. And one thing you could do is you could combine them into a longer word and then apply the function. You get some value here. So that's the value on the whole in the slope. Another thing you could do is you could compute the values on the parts. So you could compute the value of the function on this left part and compute the value of the function on this right part. So these are the values on the part. And the compositionality principles say that if you know the top information, then you know the bottom information. That's what it says. That the bottom is determined from the top. Okay? And what does it mean for one thing to be determined by another thing? It formally speaking means that there's a function from pairs of elements to elements which says, if I know this, then this is depend de determined by applying this function. That's what it means to depend on something. There's a function which realizes the dependency. So the formal notion of compositionality is a function H is compositional. If there exists a function G, this is the function G here, such that this diagram commutes. By trying to formalize what it means to be a function that's compositional, you give me the values on the two parts, I apply the function, it gives me the value on the whole. Okay? And now there's a, a straightforward lemma which says that this is exactly the same thing as doing a monoid homomorphism. So what the lemma says more precisely, if this function is surjective, sorry, if this, this, this compositional function is surjective, then this function which does the determining is actually, uh, is actually well, it has the appropriate type to be multiplication in a monoid, it takes two elements, and it is actually going to be associative, and therefore it will turn M into a monoid, and uh, furthermore, this will be a monoid homomorphism. One way to talk about monoid homomorphism is just to give a monoid, prove that it's associative, and prove that H is, uh, is a homomorphism. But another way, which is much more convenient in my opinion, is just to give the set here, just give a set, don't give the multiplication operation on it, give a function which ma maps values from here to the set, and just show that it is compositional in this sense. Once you have done that, then you will know that your set actually has an implicit monoid structure, and you know that this H will be a composition, uh, a, a monoid homomorphism. So I will be using this view more often. So I will just give you compositional functions. An alternative view would be to use the definition of a congruence. It should be the same. But congruences would sometimes be a bit more tedious to generalize to higher settings. So I, I, will, I will use compositional functions. So maybe let's give an example. Uh, suppose that my input alphabet has one letter only. And I take the function h, which maps a word to its length modulo 2. Is this a compositional function? If you know the length modulo 2 of the left first half, and you know the length modulo 2 of the second half, then you know the length modulo 2 of the main half. And actually, the determining is just by adding the modulo 2. So that gives you, that gives you a monoid structure here, and which is the, the structure of the two-element group. Another uh, question, I take a word, again over a one-letter alphabet, and I assign to it yes or no, depending on whether or not it has prime length. Is this a compositional function? If, if I, I split a word into two parts, which means uh, I split, a, I, I decompose a number as an addition of two different numbers, and I know if the first one is prime and the second one is prime, is that enough to determine if the, the, the whole thing is prime? Clearly no. You can find examples. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's not a compositional function, and if it were, then the set of primes would be a regular language, which it's not, but uh, so that's a non-example. Uh, what about this function? I input a word over the alphabet AB, and uh, I have three possible values, 0, 1, and a lot, and the value of the function is how many A's do I have, 0, 1, or a lot? Is this compositional? Yeah, if you know the two values for the left and second right part, then you can determine it for the bigger part. And therefore, by this lemma, uh, you can have a monoid structure here, and which makes this into a homomorphism, and it's kind of clear what the monoid, what the associative uh, uh, operation is on 0, 1, and a lot. Okay? So that's examples of compositional function. 
and, and therefore they give rise to monoids and so on. And this compositionality uh, reasoning it would be uh, much easier to use uh, when we go to, uh, to infinite structures. Okay. So that's the definition of being recognized by a finite monoid. And uh, before we take a short break, I will comp so we have this implication. I will do this implication, which is kind of obvious. And then after the break, we will go here. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, is the converse true that any, mo any finite monoid has a uh, compositional operation from some sigma star? Uh, yes, uh, you take sigma to be the generators of the monoid, for example, the whole monoid. And yeah, so that's, it, 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 it's a category isomorphism. <laughs> I, I don't know what I said, but <laughs> I'm sure it's what's supposed to be said here. So we want to show now that every, mo every language recognized by a monoid is also recognized by an automaton. And this is completely immediate. But I'll do the proof just to, to just to drive the definition into your head so that it's, 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 it's really there. So I, uh, I suppose I have a language which is recognized by this monoid homomorphism that M is finite. And I want to show that this language is recognized by a finite automaton. Uh, the automaton, it, the states are going to be the elements of the monoid. And my point for this slide is not really to prove this lemma, but it's to show you a picture which in, explains the intuition behind the monoid. Okay? And also prove the lemma, but the, the, the lemma is, is, is completely immediate. So, and now I need to define, so I have the states, and now I need to define the transition function on this automaton, and how does it work? Well, this is my input word, so this, these are my letters. So what would be my initial state? My initial state is going to be the neutral element of the monoid. And now I read a first, first letter, and what should my state be? The idea is that it will be after I have read three letters, the state of the automaton is going to be the value under f of this prefix. So the invariant is going to be that my state, the state of my automaton after reading the first 10 letters is the value under the function f of the 10 letter prefix. And uh, so you have to define the transition function of the monoid to respect that. And it's very easy because by compositionality, but by being a monoid homomorphism, if I want to know the value of the function on a three-letter prefix, then what I need to do is I need to take the value of the function on a two-letter prefix and multiply it to the right by this, this value here. And this is the transition function of the automaton. So that's the transition function. The reason why I showed this slide is that this kind of explains uh, the, in, uh, the, 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 the principle behind the monoid and an automaton. An automaton evaluates from left to right. But a monoid is prepared to, for other evaluation strategies. For example, you could translate the monoid into a right to left automaton by using the, the opposite evaluation strategy. It will also work. You could also have some other evaluation strategies where like, you split the word into half, you evaluate it in the, the, the first half in the monoid, and in parallel you evaluate the right half, and then once you're done, you, you combine them together. And so a monoid is ready for that kind of evaluation strategies as well. So it, it's a more parallel object. It doesn't, it's, it's not focused on evaluating a word from left to right. And for example, for some, for some algorithms, this is going to be convenient. If you want to evaluate some things in parallel, then you can do it more easily with a monoid than with an automaton. And typically, if you want to do it with an automaton, you have essentially implicitly translated into a monoid anyway. So uh, that's this. And the last thing that I want to do now is I want to show that every language defined by MSO is recognized by a finite, finite monoid, and this I'll do after a short five-minute break. We're going to complete the, uh, the cycle by showing that if you're definable in MSO, then you're recognized by homomorphism into a finite monoid. I already told you what that homomorphism is going to be. Uh, one way to do it would be to uh, show, to not do this arrow, but do the opposite arrow here. Uh, and show the equivalence, uh, yeah, to do the opposite arrow. Uh, sorry, uh, what I wanted to say was, yeah, this we always show. The, the opposite arrow, I think I discussed it. So it's kind of clear, I hope, but uh, it's, it's not so difficult to see. If you're recognized by a finite automaton, 
uh, to go from a finite automaton to a monoid, if it was deterministic, you just take uh, uh, associate to each word the state transformation of that of that word, and it's easy to see that it's a compositional function. So if you know the state transformation of the first half and you know the state transformation of the second half, then the state transformation of the entire thing is just the composition of these two functions. And by state transformation of a word, I mean the function uh, which inputs a state and says what would be the state after reading that word. Just a function from state to state. For a non-deterministic automata, it would be the same, and it's a classical example of a compositional function. So that would show that automata and monoids are the same. From monoid to automata, it's linear. From automaton to monoid, it's exponential, and examples can easily be found. We could do it that way, and then we would just need to show that MSO and automata are the same thing, and for example, Moshe is doing that, so that would be one way. But I want to do it a different way, because in the later parts of the lecture, I won't have automata. So I want to avoid them. Uh, and how do you do it? Well, what we're going to show is that if you're definable in MSO, then there's a natural corresponding compositional function. And therefore, a homomorphism into a model. And what is it? So suppose that you have a language which is rec defined by a sentence MSO. I want to show that it's recognized by some compositional function from all words to some finite set, and this function is supposed to be compositional, and if I have that, then I will know that actually T can be equipped with a multiplication operation on identity which makes it into a monoid, and F would, will be a homomorphism. So that's what I need to show. And uh, the function is just going to be assigning to a word its type. You have seen this in Stefan's lecture, but I'll do it uh, from scratch in case you've forgotten, or you haven't been to that lecture. Okay, so let's do this, but I will do it uh, using Ehrenfeucht Freise games, which I think is maybe more intuitive, at least to me. So, uh, for that, we need to have an Ehrenfeucht Freise game for MSO. And if you haven't seen Ehrenfeucht Freise games for FO, you won't lose anything because the whole definition is here anyway. So, what, what does it, what, what, how does this game work? So, suppose I have two words and consider the following game. Uh, these are words, uh, so there, the, the, there's an alphabet, uh, blue, red, gray, or green, I don't know, kind of green, red, color, what is it? And uh, the, 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 the game is played by two players called spoiler and duplicator, and it has a certain amount of rounds, which is a parameter. So uh, the more rounds there will be, the harder it will be for duplicator to win. And eventually, the only way to win would be to have the same two words. Uh, so in each round, it works as follows. So first, the spoiler player makes his move, and there's two types of move he could make. If it would be the standard there and fight price again for first order logic, there would only be one type of move. But because we're dealing a logic with two types of quantifiers, element and set quantifiers, we would have two types of move. You could reduce it to one type of move, but I'll do it this this way. So spoiler chooses a move type. So he's either going to do an element move or a set of element moves. And suppose that he uh, made, said, okay, I will do an element move. So how does it work? If spoiler says he's going to do an element move, then what he does is he chooses one of the structures and chooses an element in it. So one of the words, if these were word structures, and the position. So he, put, he uh, said that this is his position X. And then duplicator needs to respond with an analogous position in the other word and the intuition is that duplicator gives a position in the other word which is very similar to this position here. So he said, okay, I think that this position is the same. Uh, at least it has the same color, promising. Uh, so that, that's his move, okay? If, on the other hand, so suppose that was the first round, so now we have these two positions. And in the second round, duplicator says, no, now I make a set of elements move. Okay, so he makes a set move. If he does that, then he picks one of the structures. For example, now he could pick the left structure. And he picks a set of elements in it. Not a single position, but a set of positions. So he picks a set of positions, like maybe he picked three positions. And now duplicator has to respond with a set of positions in the, analog, uh, in the other structure. And then, you know, the round continues. Maybe now in the third round, 
spoiler picks this set of elements in this word, so duplicate the response like this, and maybe now in the fourth round, uh, uh, spoiler uh, picks a position move, an, uh, an element move, he picks a position here and duplicate the response. And suppose we only played four rounds, so after we've played four rounds, uh, or we could do this at the end of each round. It, it doesn't affect the, the, the whole thing. So at the end of each round, so in particular at the end, we check if the two situations are the same. And the two situations are the same means that the, they sat satisfy the same underlying predicates. So, for example, uh, if I have a position X here and the matching position X here, then they should have the same label. So for every a lab label in the alphabet, A of X should hold if and only if A of X goes here, so they should have the same color. They should also be the same in the sense that if he's, it so happened that X was equal to Y, which is not the case here, but in general it could be, then their response would have to be the same. If it so happened that little X belongs to big X, which doesn't happen anywhere here, then the same would have to be the situation. And uh, finally, if it so happens that little x is before little y, so here little y is before little x, the same has to be here. So the situations have to be the same with respect to the underlying predicates that we have chosen. And remember, to model words, we have chosen these two types of predicates. And so you played, say, five rounds, and if at the end of the five rounds, duplicator managed to keep this being true all the time, then duplicator wins. Otherwise, spoiler, lose, spoiler wins. So in particular, it could be the case that already after three rounds, something is broken, and then, you know, duplicator could give up or straight away because he's going to lose anyway. So you could imagine the game being uh, prematurely terminated. Uh, but you can also just wait until the end. You're doomed, but you just play on. So that's the Aaron Foyt Flex again. The exact same game as the Aaron Foyt. It's not the, the, the who wins or loses matter, it's the games that matter. <laughs> it's the spirit, you know? Spirit what a. What a <laughs> exactly. So he lost already in the first round, but he played yeah. Omega rounds after that. And <laughs> uh, so that's the game. It's, it's the exact same game as for FO, except you have this, this additional uh, type of set move. And it's a general principle that for most logics, it's relatively straightforward to devise the matching Aaron Foyt price again. I mean, sometimes you make, need to make a little bit of effort if you have some exotic quantifiers or more challenging quantifiers, but typically it's like, you know, straight away what the game is going to be, okay? At least here is the case. I mean, for example, you could imagine the Aaron Foyt price again for second order logic, not necessarily monadic second order logic, and then the game would be what, you know, Spoiler gets to pick a set of, not elements, but gets to pick a set of pairs. And then duplicate responds with a set of pairs and same game. And especially the matrix extend, counting extensions are, uh, yeah. So there are exceptions to this rule. But this is not one of them. This is, it's, it's, it's. For temporal logics also is the case that if you just sit down at the, with a piece of paper, you'll figure out the game, what it is. Uh, okay, so that's the Aaron Foyt price again. The, the main result is that it characterizes MSO in the following sense, that uh, how can you win, duplicator wins the five round game on this pair of words, if and only if this, they sat, the two words satisfy the same MSO formulas of quantifier rank five. Quantifier rank is you look at the parse tree of a of a formula and you count the number of quantifiers on each path. Mm -hmm. So, and you can see that it's the same thing, so you can prove this, it's not so difficult to see. So winning the K round game means have satisfying the same quantifier rank K formulas. Uh, so uh, let's call two, two structures, in this case it's going to be finite words, K equivalent, if duplicator can, has a winning strategy in the K round game. As I just said, this means the same thing. Uh, this is equivalent to saying that the two words satisfy the same quantifier rank K MSO formula. And there are some basic uh, observations about this, uh, this thing. 
and I will formulate them in a moment, but before I do, I will say now what is going to be my compositional function. I said this already previously. You map, a, you take a word to the set T, and the set T is going to be equivalence classes of this relation. So you're going to map each word to, to its equivalence class under this. And how do you represent this is a little bit uh, more technical. I, I, I don't go into that. And K is going to be, and I, I think it, oh, I think it's my slides are in the wrong order. You're going to choose K to be the rank of this formula, quantify a rank of this formula. So I have a sentence phi of MSO, and I will show that it's going to be recognized by some compositional function, namely the function which maps, inputs a word, and outputs the, its equivalence class of K equivalence, where K is the quantifier rank. Uh, as I said, the equivalence class under K equivalence uniquely determines which MSO formulas of quantifier rank K are true in U. Therefore, this function may or may not be compositional. It will be, as we will show, but it certainly recognizes the language because if you input a word and you want to know, does it satisfy this formula, you look at this equivalence class, it tells you because it this determines all four formulas of quantifier rank K in particular, this particular. So this is, this is a function which recognizes it. Is it compositional? Well, yes. Well, first of all, uh, it, it should be, in order to be recognized, well, I f first should say that it's an equivalence relation. Uh, so uh, this is maybe not entirely obvious, but it's not difficult to see. So, it, so what's, what, what you should see that is transitive. So if duplicator has a winning strategy which connects words W1 and W2, and he has a winning strategy which connects W2 with W3, then you can compose those two strategies into one which, which, which connects W1 with W3. So it's a transitive relation. It also has finitely many equivalence classes. This is something that Stefan mentioned. Uh, and uh, there's several ways to see it. One of them would be as follows, as I mentioned, your equivalence class under K equivalence is the same thing as the set of MSO formulas of quantifier rank K that you satisfy. If you normalize MSO formulas of quantifier rank K by removing duplicate subformulas, then there's finitely many different uh, MSO formulas that you could write, and therefore there's finitely many equivalence classes that you could write. So it has finitely many equivalence classes. So this is a function into a finite set. It's a well-defined set because of the equivalent relation, and it's, it's finite. Uh, this is the second property that I already mentioned several times. So k-equivalent formulas satisfy the same MSO sentence of given quantifier rank. In particular, uh, this function recognizes this for formula if k was chosen to be as in the formula. And number three, the most important thing, it's a compositional function. Uh, why is it a compositional function? Let's do this argument in a little bit more detail. Okay. Uh, so I claim that it's a compositional function. So what I need to show is that if I have, this boils down to showing that if I have two K equivalent words here and two K equivalent words here, and I join them, then the big words are going to be K equivalent. If this is uh, something called a congruence. And if you think about the same thing as compositionality, because uh, uh, it says that if I, if I com com compose these two, these two words, I don't need to know which one it was as long as I know the K equivalence class of it. That's what this says. It doesn't matter which representative of the K equivalence class you chose. It doesn't matter which representative of the K equivalence cl class you chose here. That doesn't matter as long as you're only interested in the k-equivalence class. Here, that's what uh, compositional function means. And then this boils down to saying that the k-equivalence here and k-equivalence here implies k-equivalence here. So compositional function and congruences are the same thing. Okay? And let's prove this. So we just unfold the definition. The Aaron feucht freistadt definition here is the more convenient one. So I have to say that if duplicator has a winning strategy here, and duplicator has a winning strategy here, then duplicator has a winning strategy here. And I'm just going to copy these strategies in the obvious way, but I like to do the argument to underline why it works and why it does not extend to some other logics. Okay? So 
I need to find a duplicator winning strategy for this pair of words using duplicator winning strategies here and here. How do we do this? Well, let's, let's suppose we, wa we want to, we are duplicator now. So spoiler makes his move. This is what he says. Now we need to respond as duplicator. Well, what we see, this, this, this word, it comes from the first half. So we say, well, what would happen if spoiler made his the same, the corresponding move here? And now duplicator has allegedly a response here and we copy that response downward, okay? Now, uh, there's a second round, and spoiler plays a set move. We have to respond. And now we're going to use both structures. So this is a word which has the first half and the second half. So we ask, what well, we decompose the set into the corresponding parts in the first half and the second half, and we play two spoiler moves in parallel, okay? And now, in each case, uh, before, and then we're going to use duplicators' responses to, uh, to and copy them back. But now I want to underline a key thing. That here it's very important that we use MSO, and we're not going to use, for example, full second order logic. Because you might say, well, why doesn't this work for other logics? So, for example, uh, the Aaron Foyt Freise game, where spoiler is about to use, allowed to use a set of pairs. This would not work for spoiler moves where he does set of pairs. And the reason is that a set of positions in the big word is uniquely determined by the corresponding sets of the positions in the first half and the second half. And this is not true for binary relations. Okay? Because there could be crosses. So that's why it's crucial that we're using MSO here. Okay? And that is why all this, this type of, when you're going to want to use, comp uh, if you're interested in using compositionality, MSO is the limit of what you can do. And this is where we're going to be working, okay? So this argument would not work for sets of triples and so on. It would not work for second or logic. So it is a naive use of compositionality will not work for lo logic such as that. MSO, yes, beyond no. Okay, so I wanted to drive this message. That th this is why, this is one answer to, you know, you could ask yourself, why do these automata people talk about MSO all the time? I mean, why not other logics? Here's the answer. Because MSO has compositionality, other logics don't. That's why the compositionality people use MSO. Okay, so that's, and then, so once you have that, then you just use duplicator response, you copy it back down, and you know, you continue. And you will see that this, this, this works out, okay? So, this argument is very general. I, wrote, I did it with two pieces. It could be eight pieces. It could be infinitely many pieces. I mean, we'll get to the details of what it means, infinitely many pieces, but it could be, okay? So, it's a very robust argument. The pieces could even be arranged in a tree shape. And then you have to be a bit clear what, the, what that means, but that would also work. So it's a very robust argument. It's always the same argument, and, and it really works robust. Okay, so this is a compositional function, and we're done. Yeah? So we establish that the function, which inputs a word, maps it to its k-equivalence class, is a compositional function into a finite set and therefore, it is a monoid homomorphism. In particular, by that lemma that you had at the beginning, this compositionality principle, there is an implicit monoid structure on this set. The lemma doesn't say what it is. I mean, you can work it out uh, if you want, but you don't really need to, to, to remember it. It just exists, okay? So we're done with that part of the proof. So that we have closed the triangle, finite automata, MSO, and finite monoids, they're all the same. And we have done it using uh, monoids. And now I'd like to, uh, in the rest of, of, of this lecture, I'd like to try to justify why use monoids. Why not work only in automata? There's advantages to working only with automata, but now I want to explain what are the advantages of doing it the other way. So I'm not saying that monoids are the only way. Uh, so why use monoids? Oh. And why not just use automata? So here's some answers to, to, to this question. So one answer is that 
monoids, and this I already alluded to previously, they allow to use an evaluation strategy, which is not from left to right, but in parallel, for example. And these, this can be convenient for some algorithms. Here's a very straightforward data structure that you could use. And in, I mean, you might, you know, you, let's see it. So suppose you have oh, an input word and you want to check some regular property. For example, does it have even length? One way to do it would be to scan the word from left to right and, you know, even odd, even odd, even, even, even odd, 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 or something, and then at the end you know. That would take linear time. But you could do parallel evaluation in the obvious way. You split the word, uh, you split the word into a tree, and then you compute the parity uh, this way, yes? And this implicitly, it corresponds to evaluate to using this monoid homomorphism because it says you could in parallel use the right side and left side. There's, there's no effect on the other as long as you compose it using a monoid. And that says that, that, that shows, in particular, if you want to evaluate uh, membership in a regular language, you can do this in a parallel way, in lo logarithmic, logarithmic time. I show this, uh, I show this, I mean, you can make this argument without using the word monoid, and people do it sometimes, but this is what's going on. Uh, but the main reason why I show this is that using some more fancy results in monoid, we will show how this, this idea can be improved in a non-trivial way. Okay? We'll get to that in a moment. But but one thing you can do in this particular, day. I think, one advantage of this. Very often we want to know if some property is definable in some fragment. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that part as well. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. That's a beautiful, yes, I, I, will, I will talk about that. This is something that you just don't know how to do any other way. Uh, uh, another thing you could do with this data structure is the following thing. Suppose you've evaluated this word. Now you know that it has odd length. I think I'm actually counting not the length of the word, but the number of B's modulo 2 or something, or number of A's modulo 2. What you can also do is you can do updates. So suppose that you know this, you have calculated this, this, this data structure, and now somebody changes this letter. And then you can update it just by updating the relevant parts of the tree, and then you can do this in logarithmic time. This is a very naive, naive divide and conquer approach. It also works for trees, for example. You have to figure it out the details, but it also works for trees. So you have a tree decomposition of a tree. Uh, but this alone, I don't think it's sufficient because you don't need to know monoids to, to do that. You can label, instead in the node, instead of having a monoid, you can have a pair of states or maybe a state transformation and, you know, just calling it a monoid and a homomorphism, you could just, yeah, call that, exactly. So that's, that's, I don't think that's on its own sufficient. But here are some things where really monoids start to live on their own, which is that uh, unlike automata, Monoids have a structural theory. So what's an automaton? It's a graph. What in, how, what in general can you say about a graph? Nowhere dense, uh, boundary three-way. In general, you cannot say nowhere dense. <laughs> uh, well, that, that, that is a property of a class of graphs. And uh, there's very little uh, uh, useful things you could do with an arbitrary uh, graph. You could depone, it's a, it's, a connect, it's, a, it's a directed graph, so maybe you could compose it into, decompose it into strongly connected components. It doesn't get you very far. But for monoids, you can have, and I will show them, you can have some nice theorems which says, say, every monoid can be decomposed as blah, 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 which you don't have for graphs I mean, in a non-trivial way. Uh, that's, that's one reason I'll try to illustrate it now. And the second reason, which I will try to illustrate later in this talk, is that monoids generalize better. I will explain this. In a, uh, so it will be very straightforward to see what the monoid for infinite words is going to be. Okay? And, and it's, it, for automata, each time you need to have a good idea. For monoids, less so at least to generalize the definition, I mean, not to, to prove the theorem, but the different story. So here's one beautiful theorem about monoids, which shows that they have a structural theory. The, the cron is called the cron roads theorem. And it says the following thing. It says that every finite monoid divides a reef product of monoids. Uh, and I have to explain, uh, and these monoids, these factors, have a spe certain special form. 
And now I would have to explain what all these words mean and what is the special form. So divides means it's a, it's a quotient of a submonoid, so you can, yeah, that, it, it's a natural notion of being smaller. So, uh, and the, there's a main, the main thing is about what the factors mean. So the factors, there's two types of things you could do. Each factor is either a cyclic group, Z5, Z7, or if you're not using a cyclic group, there's only one other monoid you're going to use. It's a certain three element monoid, which in the literature is called U2. I don't know why. And it's kind of morally speaking, uh, the monoid which corresponds to the until operator of first order logic. So I don't remember if I have it on my slides. Oh, I do. So what's the monoid until? It's a three element monoid which has three elements, A, B, and the identity. And the multiplication operation works as follows. If you want to multiply all these elements, what you do is you ignore the ones, as you're supposed to do, and then you come across the first one, which is not one, and then you output it. Okay, so it's, you have a C, uh, the multiplication operation. If it's a one, then it's ignored, and otherwise you, you give the first element. It's a monoid. It, it, you can, I think, if you're familiar with until, you can see the correspondence. It's a fixed two-element, three-element monoid. And the Cronroth's theorem says that every finite monoid can be decomposed into a product of either groups or this until monoid. And the final thing that I should explain is what product operation am I using? And this is not the normal cross product where you just take the pairs of elements with component-wise multiplication. It's a more fancy product operation. And the moral principle behind it is it corresponds to nesting of, 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 of formulas in temporal logic. The definition takes some time to write and even more time to understand. I won't go into that, but it's a sort of, it's a, it's a natural thing. It comes from group theory originally. And you have this beautiful theorem that every monoid can be decomposed into these very simple basic bricks. And it was proved, I think, in the 60s. And it's a very powerful result. And you, you, there's no such thing for automata. I mean, unless you start dressing up automata as monoids, and then you can just re-say re it. But uh, there's no such thing for automata. And that's, that's where semi-groups and monoids, they come into, in, 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 into play. They, you can really have non-trivial decomp results. Can I just, yeah, so you can think of an automaton as, um, if you think of a transition function of an automaton, you can think of it as uh, matrix multiplication, right? You, you, uh, you, you have, uh, yes. um, you know, you apply. And, and can you relate this to, to is, is there a natural monoid where, where, you, where uh, this can be, uh, where you can just, uh, you know, leverage this or represent this. So, so if I want to know whether I'm accepting the word, uh, you know, ABC, then I, I look at, uh, you know, I've got my starting vector, then I do MA times MB times MC, and I project on the last mm -hmm. state, I see if it's an accepting state. Yeah. And does that, is that corresponding in a very natural way to what happens at the monoid level? Well, yes, you're, uh, this monoid of matrices, in a, uh, it's going to be Boolean matrices, and, yeah. and so they, they, they form a monoid and then multiply. Yes, yeah, so this is a representation theorem. And there's, there's every monoid is of, every finite monoid is of this 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 type. The, of this type is divide. Yeah, and then the street product would it correspond to the fact that every matrix can be represented as a sequence of elementary operations or something like that? No, no. Yeah. Uh, if you like automata as I do then the reading is as follows. You can view an automaton as a device. Typically, it waits until the end and says yes or no. Yeah. But what it really does is it's a transducer. It labels every position with the state. And now what you can have, the reef product corresponds to the following thing. You run a first automaton, and not only does it say yes or no, but it, it leaves like a trail of states. And then you run a second automaton, which reads not only the input word, but the trail of states. And you, you're allowed to do this 10 times. That's the reef product. So viewed this way, it says you can consider two types of automata. Group automata, it says a group automaton is one which just uh, 
counts module of five, the number of letters of a given type. And then you have this special U, U2 autom until automaton, it's a free state automaton. I mean, you might, uh, the, 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 the graph is the same, but the labeling by input letters, you can choose it. And then the theorem stated in the automaton way says that every finite automaton, deterministic finite automaton can be simulated by a composition in this sense uh, of several layers such that each small automaton used is either a group automaton or this until automaton. The Cronrod theorem says more. It says not only is this true, but every brick that you use, which is of these two types, was originally found in your monoid to begin with. In particular, if your monoid did not contain any groups, all of your bricks are going to be until bricks. And if you unravel the definitions, that says that every monoid without groups or every, out, uh, uh, every mon monoid without groups can be, or every automaton without groups in a certain natural sense, can be simulated by a composition of 100 untils or you know, 200 untils. And that gives you the, in, the difficult implication in the Kampf theorem. And it was proved more or less in the same, same time. The weird thing about this very powerful theorem, I can't think of any application of it. Well, one application is the Kampf theorem. Oh. The, the Kampf theorem about first order logic equal to F, 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 uh, LTL. Yes, if you, if you work in automata. Uh, that, that's one application of it. Uh, and it is stronger than the Kampf theorem because it says, it, it gives a stronger result because it says not only is first order logic equal to until, but if you take MSO, which corresponds to arbitrary monoid, then it, the corresponding logic is uh, until plus group modalities. So it strengthens it and it even gives you a decision procedure. So that's one nice application. Another application, there's a, uh, there's a paper by, if you remember, I, I, I presented this naive data structure uh, uh, where you uh, could update a word. So you want to know if it has even length and you want to do updates in logarithmic time. A natural question is, can you do this in constant time? And the answer is no. And, uh, but you want to show that you cannot do it and now, now this is an algorithm's lower bound so you have to say in the RAM model or something and if you properly specify your model, you can prove that this cannot be done in uh, constant time and this was done by uh, Danish uh, Peter Bromiltersen, and the way he proved it is using the Cronrod theorem. Well, actually, no. The, the way he proved a positive result was using the. So there was a matching upper and lower bound, uh, and for the upper bound, he used the Cronrod decom decomposition result. So if you do that, and there's other things, I think there's a recent result of Luc Segoufin for updating queries again. If you know that every query can be decomposed in a given way, then that's useful uh, because all you have to treat is the atomic queries and then have some way of treating the composition and then you're done. So that's, that's one way to use it. A corresponding result, which I have already discussed in uh, speaking and also Moshe mentioned it, is these uh, sublogic things. So if you remember, so the main theorem we had was MSO is the same thing as finite monoids. But what about first order logic? So uh, this is not the same. So for example, uh, parity is not defined in first order logic. And Moshe already mentioned this in his talk. So you cannot uh, have a first order logic formula which is true exactly in words of even length. So that corresponds to only somehow some finite monoids, and there's a very beautiful answer to this, which is the, uh, yeah, so formulas like this. You can say non-trivial things without the set quantifiers. I don't think this is an example of a non-trivial thing. I don't remember what the formula says. And there's a beautiful theorem, I think my favorite theorem, of Schuttenberger, which says that definable in first order logic with the order relation, is the same thing as being recognized by a finite aperiodic monoid, which means a monoid which does not contain a group in the natural sense. And this is just stunning. I mean, you have two completely different notions and, 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 and they coincide. And uh, so here's a, a story about monoids. So you can have a look at Schittenberg's original proof, which is one of the optimal proofs of this theorem. There's several other uh, optimal proofs, but uh, already Schutzenberg's original one is, 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 is optimal in certain senses. It's very beautiful. 
but it uses you know algebra and some algebraic uh, things, you might want to have a direct proof which just uses automata. And you can do that. So what you can prove is something called the uh, uh, McNaughton Papert theorem, which says that uh, definable in first order logic, if and only if recognized by a finite counter free automaton, counter free deterministic automaton. Counter free automaton is the, is the automaton version of aperiodic monoids. There's a natural notion of what it means for an automaton to be counter free, and then you can prove that it's the same thing. So we could add a third condition counter free automaton, and then you can prove this uh, without knowing anything about monoids. You can prove the theorem, uh, and actually it's even simpler than the uh, Schutzenberger proof. So, it, you know, then why use monoids then? But it did happen, historically it happened in this direction. You first did it, you first observe it in semi-groups, and then you can strip away the semi-groups, replace it by automata, and get a simpler proof. And there are multiple instances of this phenomenon. There are results about automata that are first proved by using semi-groups, and then once you understand it, you strip away the automata, you get a simpler proof with better uh, uh, coefficients in, uh, in terms of automata, and you can forget about the semi-groups. But it happens in that order and not the opposite one. Because if you work with a semi-group or a monoid, you get a deeper insight. And then somehow you can pretend you didn't have it, but it's, it's useful to, to, to have that insight. Okay. Mikoai, yes? If you start from a periodic monoid and you apply Kronros decomposition, do you get a special form? Yes. So, so, so uh, the, the difficult direction in the Schutzenberger theorem is an immediate corollary of the Kronrod theorem. Because the Kronrod theorem says that every monoid, in particular an aperiodic one, divides this product. And it says that the groups, they had to be in the original monoid. So if you didn't have any groups, then you get only the until monoid. So it implies something even stronger than the Schutzenberger because it also gives you, by the way, LTL. So, it's, it's, so that's, that's a direct corollary of the, of the Kronrod theorem. Then the, 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 the opposite direction is, 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 is the easy one. I think the up theorem that uh, said that, let's say, you're looking at a particular fragment of LTL, it will co correspond to monoids with some algebraic properties, and for which the, the automata theoretic properties are not transparent yeah. at all. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so you could have different things, like, for example, uh, my personal fact A periodic has a counter free structure which you understand. But not all algebraic properties not are easily, easily transferred. So I, I tell you my favorite one. My favorite one is the Shimon theorem. And in the next slide, you will have a different Shimon theorem. So, uh, but the same Shimon. Although he has brothers, but uh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, which, uh, so you could do this, you know, why first order logic, you know, maybe two variable first order logic. Or maybe, you know, formulas of first order logic which use the universal quantifiers exactly six times or something like that. Yes? Uh, and there's a, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite ones is the Schumann theorem, which says uh, there's a natural quantifier alternation hierarchy in first order logic, which you have existent purely existential formulas. So now we have to be careful about negation. Yes? So an existential formula is exist x, exist y, exist z. You can do as many variables as you want as, as long as only existential quantifiers, and then you have a quantifier free part. And uh, then you have purely the, the complement, so purely universal formulas, and then you can start alternating quantifiers. And uh, you have like uh, alternation one, alternation two, alternations. And on, e on each alternation, you have the positive part and the, uh, the, the existential part and the, and, the, and the universal part. And there's this big project of uh, characterizing which languages can be defined by a existential formula uh, of alt quantifier alternation six, for example. So a block of existential quantifiers, a block of universal quantifiers, and you know, six times like this. I mean, the, the, so the total number of blocks is six, so... Uh, and this project has been realized up until, I think, alternation five. And, yeah. <laughs> Satisfying property, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's the answer. But up, up until alternate, you go quantifier, uh, uh, if you have purely existential formulas, this is easy. A language is defined by, uh, this is essentially uh, uh, Wojtarski, I think. 
I don't remember the right name. A language is defined by a first order formula which is purely existential if and only if it's closed under inserting letters. This is a straightforward to understand. Uh, however, already Boolean combinations of existential formulas is a highly non-trivial result. It's a very beautiful theorem. This is the one that I mentioned, the Schumann theorem. A language is definable by a Boolean combination of existential formulas if and only if it is recognized by a monoid which is J-trivial. It's a it, J-trivial. Yeah. I could have said alpha optimal. But, uh, I said J-trivial. Uh, <laughs> And it's a, if you learn the theory of monoids, it's a very natural property of monoids, and there's no way you can say this for automata, as, as, as far as I know. And then you can ask about you know, the next level. You have to be careful, you go take baby steps. I took Boolean combination of sigma one. You could now take sigma two, but actually you, you, there's an intermediate step, which is delta two. That also has a very nice characterization in terms of algebra, it's, it's, it's DA. <laughs> These, I don't know who comes up with these names. And uh, I mean, even the semi-group people, they don't know. You know, you ask them why it's called J-trivia, and they, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it means the following. In a monoid, not necessarily finite, you could define the infixed relation. So an element of a monoid is an infix of another one. You know, if you can multiply it from both sides and get to the bigger one, yeah? So that's, that's an infixed relation. And a monoid is J-trivial, and for some reason, the monoid people call this the J-relation. And uh, a monoid is J-trivial if this relation is trivial. So you can never find two different elements which are mutual infixes of each other. It's a very natural property, actually. And it turns out to have important algebraic consequences, and one of them is corresponding exactly to Boolean combinations of existential sentences. And then, you know, you, have, you go up this quantifier hierarchy, and I think, like, for the first five steps, these are half steps, so by the end of doing the first five steps, you go up to level two and a half or something. Uh, there's very nice, <laughs> nice algebraic things, and there's like each, each level has five equivalent formulations. Okay, that doesn't go on forever. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, sigma four. It's, mm. <laughs> but there's an algorithm. If, if you absolutely need to know if your language is definable in four quantifier alternations, then, then you can do it. Uh, so is this related to star height? Uh, it is uh, related to... Uh, no. <laughs> uh, not really, no. <coughs> star height is a classification on a, on a different size. No, but it... Well, okay, so there's a, a certain connection which is generalized star height where you're allowed to use complement. So there's two star heights, there's star height with complements and star height without complements. And the star height without complements is a relatively well understood thing now and essentially with very little to do with, 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 with this. The star height with complements, on the other hand, it's a little bit connected to this because level zero, so no stars but complements, is this. And it's an open problem if, you, if, if level one is all languages, is there anything to be gained by going from level one to level two? This is a, a challenging open problem. Okay, I, I think I, we should make a, a break. I, and I'm behind schedule, but what, what you're going to do?